I know I said I would step away from the Star Wars Cassian Andor series for a bit, and technically I did. But there has been this thought in my head, and I figured I was alone in it until one viewer here talked about their thoughts on it. So first, I want to give a shout out to Do Re Mi Fa So La Ti Do for the inspiration to go on and make this one. There's something very familiar with the people of Ferrix. Well, familiar if you know about different Star Wars cultures. The way Cassian Andor himself seems more of a loner and an amateur mercenary. The way the people of Ferrix banded together when their home was threatened by outsiders. And the use of a Beskar anvil as a bell. Now, these aren't the only coincidences between those of Ferrix Uprising and the Mandalorian culture, but they are the clues that got me thinking. Are the people of Ferrix descendants of a lost tribe of Mandalorians? Well, that's what we're going to discuss today, so stick around for the full video and let's see what you think when I'm finished. If you love Star Wars as much as I do, or you're just a casual fan wanting to talk about the greatest franchise ever created, then you've come to the right place, because Star Wars is all I talk about, and I upload new content, well, whenever I can, really. So if you have an interest or love for Star Wars, go on and hit that subscribe button and turn on all your notifications and join this growing channel for deeper discussions, theories, and Star Wars lore. Each one of you is appreciated more than you know. Now. Let's get on with today's topic. Before we move forward, this is just a theory. And with theories, you have to take them with a grain of salt until it's either confirmed or proven wrong. Theories are just something to think about, and they help us look a little bit deeper into the Star Wars movies and shows, just for our enjoyment. Let's take a look at some of the clues. The first is the time grappler. You know, the guy in the tower striking his hammers against the anvil at the beginning and end of every day. Ferrix is full of scrap metal. There are no short supply of metals to make a bell or anvil. So why is this anvil made of Beskar? How did he get the precious metal? From what we know from the Mandalorian series, Beskar is meant to only be in the possession of Mandalorians. Cobb Vanth reiterates this by saying that Boba Fett's armor he's wearing is Mandalorian and it's Din Djarin's duty to return it to the Mandalorian people. And since it's now confirmed that Boba Fett's armor is indeed Beskar, well, you get the picture. But if you're thinking it's not necessarily Beskar that needs to be returned, we also know the Empire mined the Beskar from Mandalore when they took it over and the Mandalorians won it back. Okay, so we saw Din Djarin return about 50 pounds of Beskar in an ice cream maker from an Imperial client. This was seen as a great supply. But what about the Time Grappler's Anvil? This has to be at least one ton of Beskar or even more. And the Cassian Andor series takes place during a time when Mandalorians weren't very giving of their finest resource. Okay, maybe the Beskar Anvil is made from smaller bits of Beskar melted down until such a size was reached. That brings another clue to the people of Ferrix being Mandalorian descent or at least in good favor with the Mandalorians. Why? Because Beskar can only be forged by a Mandalorian armorer. That means the anvil was made by a Mandalorian, not some lowly scrapper in a steelworkers union. Think about this. The Imperial client that Din Djarin dealt with had a supply of Beskar. The Beskar was enough to make one suit of Mandalorian armor for an adult with some left over for foundlings. So why didn't the client use the metal to make his own armor? Because he couldn't. As I said, Beskar can only be forged by a Mandalorian armorer. In typical situations, the Beskar was useless to the client. He could only use it in trade. So the anvil had to have been made by a Mandalorian. Does that mean the time grappler is Mandalorian? Not necessarily. It could have been a gift to the people of Ferrix as a reminder of who they are. It isn't that much of a stretch when you think about the lore behind Beskar. I could go on and on about that, but let's move on, shall we? Let's take a look at Cassian Andor himself. We know he is originally from Canari. That isn't a Mandalorian settlement, nor homeworld. But Cassian Andor didn't grow up on Kanari. He was found there and taken in by Marva Andor and raised as her own. Which culture do we know of that does that? Other than Jedi taking babies, slave owners keeping young and raising them as servants or laborers, no one other than Mandalorians that we know of. 
Once an orphan is found, they are brought into Mandalorian society and taught the culture, the way of the Mandalore. Now, look at how Cassian Andor acts. His behaviors and his seemingly careless attitude for the lives of his adversaries. He doesn't think twice about killing someone opposing him, but that alone isn't enough to call him a Mandalorian foundling. As I stated before, lost tribe. With any lost tribes of our own world, we see similarities in them and their parent culture, even though there are distinguished differences. We do see a lot of cultural similarities, and in Cassian Andor, we can see some of the Mandalorian traditions in him. He's mostly been a loner on his exploits throughout the galaxy, but when the time came, he had a strong sense of community and family and duty to his people. Cassian Andor took on being a mercenary of sorts, one of the honorable professions of Mandalorians. Although he was out there alone, he still maintained his connection to his family and his community. And we see that through his interactions with his mother and the flashbacks of his father. He even went as far as to attack Imperial clones for the death of his father. Cassian also fights in the same manner as we would see a Mandalorian fight. This is highlighted in the first scenes of the Andor series. When he's approached by the security officers of Morlana 1, he dispatches them with ease through quick hand-to-hand -hand combat movements. Considering these officers were kind of drunken idiots, they still would have been trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But Cassian made short work of them. Then there are the actual citizens of Ferrix. The biggest clue is the uprising against their Imperial guests. When we look at much of the galaxy during this time, most human planets are accepting of the imperial rule. Some even welcome it. Some are just nonchalant, as they realize it's just another government in charge, and it's no different than the others before it. Miggs Mayfeld said it better than I ever could have, but the good citizens of Ferrix are mostly unaware of the atrocities committed by the Empire, other than individuals like Bix Colleen, who stays in regular contact with a rebel outsider, much like Bo-Katan Kreese and Ahsoka, or a Satine Kreese and Obi-Wan Kenobi. But the fact that the general populace has stayed out of galactic affairs, yet still bound together to fight the Empire, speaks volumes. Then look at the Time Grappler once again. In the moment where he Sparta kicked the Stormtrooper out of the Bell Tower, he had two weapons in his hands. Hammers. Yet he didn't use them. The hammers and the anvil are either sacred or relics. When we see Brasso preparing for work, it's noted that everyone hangs their gloves in the same location. It's the same with the hammers. As the gloves are stored closer to the workers' jobs, the hammers are hung close to their best car anvil, not taken home to hammer nails in a home remodeling project. They have one purpose, to strike the anvil, and they're not to be desecrated by hitting a stormtrooper with them. They didn't care about galactic politics. They wanted their anonymity, just like Mandalore and its people. And they didn't do it by hiding in the forest and resigning to guerrilla tactics that pronounced their intentions in town square in front of their imperial overseers, and they banded together and attacked them openly. There were no secret plans made. They didn't retreat to find a better time to do it. They decided, and they acted immediately, something we see Mandalorians do often all while being surrounded by the oppressive imperial forces. And it wasn't about beating the entire empire. It was about kicking them off their planet. They could care less if they ruled the rest of the galaxy. Yes, Marva mentioned her plans to be a rebel, but this could have only meant she wanted to rebel against the empire on her planet, not join the larger rebellion. A lot of the argument against Ferrix being a lost tribe or settlement of Mandalore is that no one wears the armor. And I get that, but let's look at Mandalore during the Clone Wars. The citizens didn't wear the armor. For most cases, it was the highly skilled warriors with warrior lineage that wore the Beskar armor openly, even when not in combat situations. But there is the tenet of the Rezonari that states a Mandalorian must wear the armor. But this lost tribe may not know of the Rezulnari, or that their traditions are so far removed from that warrior culture of their origins, they are no longer needed. And as they want to be left in peace, just as Duchess Satine Kreese and her new Mandalorians did. 
Then again, this could all be written off as coincidence and that everything in Star Wars doesn't have to have a deeper meaning and everything doesn't have to be connected to Sith, Jedi, or Mandalorians. Like I said before, this is just something fun to think about. It would be a great way to connect the Cassian Andor series to the Mandalorian and the other Star Wars projects if this were to be a fact. And we know the creators of the new Star Wars era are trying to connect as much as they can to the larger stories. The biggest of these stories is what's been dubbed the Mandoverse. And if, big if, this theory about Cassian Andor and the citizens of Ferrix is at all accurate, it would tie into the Mandalorian universe nicely. Much like the Darth Jar Jar theory, it may never be confirmed nor denied, but I guess time will tell. Or it won't. But either way, I could go on and on for the next two years about the Cassian Andor series until season two comes out. Yes, it's that good. So let me know what you think in the comics. Do you think the Star Wars theory is possible? I'd love to hear from you. I will be jumping around on different Star Wars topics from here on out. So if you haven't yet subscribed, go on and do that now. And don't forget to give the video a big stupid thumbs up. It really does boost my channel. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, this is Gerald, a Star Wars fanatic, signing off, wishing you all great health, happiness, and peace. Be good to each other. Thank you all for watching, and remember, this is the way. And positivity in the Star Wars community is the only way.